Hello, hi. So, I just watched the season finale of Lovecraft Country, episode 10, Full Circle. Let's talk about it. But before I talk about it, I want to note something that happened in the middle of the, the show. So, the scene where um, Hippolyta slid the comic book, Arinthia Blue comic book under the door to show Dee what, what was possible, what the future could hold. And she shouted out Miss Afua, who has been, the, who's the artist who's designed the characters, who drew the characters that Dee was drawing in the episode. She drew the Arinthia Blue comic books because she's a dope, uh, she's a dope artist. And I just wanted to take a minute to shout her out because I have met her um, in passing. It's not like she's my homie, but <laughs> I've met her and bought some pieces from her. And funnily enough, damn, this is a Afua piece because she is the bomb.com. So I just wanted to shout her out and I will share her website down below because you should check her out. She does fantastic work. She is a black uh, female, you know, graphic, uh, graphic artist, artist, designer. She's fantastic. She does comic books. She's dope. She's dope. She's dope. So I just wanted to give that quick shout out because um, I heard that during the episode and was like, ah, did they just shout out a four? So sidebar. So just let's take a breath. First of all, Again, this a little wine, a little sweet red. Uh, I had to pour glass because that episode was intense. There was a lot going on. There was a lot happening. All the characters came back. Sadly enough, uh, Uncle George did not make a resurgence, but Montrose definitely stepped up to the plate and played that, you know, the paternal role that he just had not ever played in Tick's life. So he definitely did that this episode, which was awesome, fantastic, and wonderful. Um, so let's just get into it. So this was our finale where everything that we've been building up to this season came to a head. And it was called Full Circle, which means, you know, we just ended up back where we started in Artem. Um, we learned that the, um, through various moments in the season that, um, that Tick was supposed to die. We heard, we, we, we kind of heard it in different episodes, but of course it was more so, it was the big push last episode, um, when they went to Tulsa and had that experience. And so we knew that Tick was at minimum, he was supposed to die. But I will say throughout this, um, show, I all, I kind of got the feeling that maybe he wouldn't die. And, you know, and that could have just been my own, you know, wishful heart that he would not die. But as we kind of start to get through the episode, definitely I started to see things that made me think that maybe he was not going to make it. Um, and so we knew that at the autumnal equinox that Christina had the spell that she was going to do in order to become immortal. And of course, she needed Tick's blood in order to be able to do that. And so we knew, and she needed all of it. Like she didn't just need, you know, it wasn't just like a hand slash and a few drops of blood. Like she needed it all from his body. Um, so what we did learn was that they, you know, they got the book of names and the ancestral connection was just fantastic. So we got to see everyone come back we got to see Tick's mom we got to see um his we got to see you know Hannah who was the double great double great grandma triple great grandma um we got to see his grandma um return and I really liked how it was all very much connected through through Letty so like yes Tick was definitely kind of the front you know, he is the, the, the person kind of going on this hero's journey. But as I said in the very first recap, when I was talking about the first episode, was that I think that while, yes, Tick is definitely going on a hero's journey here, I definitely think that Lady is also going on a hero's journey and she's going to play a really big, important role in the pro through her own hero's journey. And sure enough, you know, she went on her own journey where she learned um she kind of connected with herself 
Um, she connected with her family. So her and Ruby, which I'll get back to in a second, her and Ruby were able to kind of have their, you know, coming together. She connected with her, the child that she was carrying um, within her, uh, the you know, that kind of connected her to the bloodline. So while she is in a direct um, recipient of the bloodline, she is the the person who is carrying essentially the, the descendant of all of this magic that we are learning about and that is becoming, you know, released into the world. And so she had to have her own journey of self-discovery because she's going to raise this child. So she has to understand what's happening. She has to, you know, play a important role because I think a big theme of this, and you know, we've seen this come up, is the whole idea of generational trauma. But what one other thing that we've seen though is these characters, even without maybe directly saying it, have all been working to to break this generational this generational line of trauma. They have been trying to change it so that it does not continue to affect future generations. And what Letty definitely represents is an opportunity to break this generational trauma for ticks family and bloodline but also for her own and so it was very um it was really good to see her you know have this awakening of the spiritual awakening and her and take get baptized um because she had been so separate from that and she had been so separate from faith and you know as anyone who is um kind of really big in a in a church community or in a religious community, not necessarily a spiritual or faith, but just kind of religious a religion, one of the things that you will kind of see and begin to understand as you get deeper into some of those studies is that faith it it also rests within you. So yes, it is about connecting with um, a higher power and a larger being, but it's also about connecting with yourself and so it was very it was very fantastic and hopeful and awesome to see letty have that moment where she was able to realize within herself that she had what she needed in order to be the person that she wanted to become and watch her to kind of go through this journey so we've got first of all having the opportunity as a black woman watching this show um, where the, the main character who, you know, initially up front is put forward, is going through this hero's journey, definitely is Tick. You definitely see that from the beginning that that's what we're going on with him. But seeing Letty go through her own very unique and separate hero's journey, while yes, their journeys for sure intertwine, their journeys for sure, you know, needed each other in various points. But when, you know, when Letty was back in the house in Tulsa and she was with um, Tick's grandmother, great-grandmother, Tick's great-grandmother, and they were having their moment and her first thought was, let me go find him and check on him. And she was like, and you know, she was like, no, you have your part to play. This is about you and your process and journey. And then having him go through his own experience with Hannah in the other room and them not knowing necessarily that they were in the same place, but then having them come together with Tick's mom and with Hannah and them kind of come to be brought together. But after they had their own level of understanding and then when they finally were able to come back together, they came back together with their own individual senses of understanding of what was going to happen what needed to happen the role that they played and then they were able to kind of move forward together along that timeline that was awesome because we don't often see that and just in general in movies and films and tv shows of this kind the woman is often a plot she's either at minimum a plot device um that is just there to move things along for the guy um, who's the main character, or she is, you know, an auxiliary storyline that's unfinished, so, or unfleshed out. So she might have her moment, but her moment is still very much 
a it's a direct line from the the male character and if his character doesn't have his experience then she doesn't have hers and it was very fantastic watching letty have her own experience and her own discovery and learning and she needed to because again with the generational trauma and, and the breaking of generational curses she had to go she had to break her own generational curse in order to be able to raise a mother the next generation of the bloodline that they were working hard to save and in that though in saving that bloodline they then also you know ultimately bestow magic to all black people which yo I, that you know i the the magnitude of that the depth of that is i think beyond me in this moment and i cannot think of how to articulate what how i can't articulate that so i'm definitely gonna have to listen to the podcast um, i want to hear what those ladies have to say because i know it's going to be some good stuff and they always kind of pinpoint and they can dig into things that i miss so i'm very interested to see i can't figure out how to articulate that and i would definitely need some more time to sit with it and see what comes to mind but really just the enormity of it is what i can say and watching this play out on television in this medium that's been getting so much attention and been so popular and seeing this diversity of character and diversity of thought in these black characters and how what they're doing is you know for the larger the larger populace of black people but it's also for themselves and the layers the layers the layers it was just fantastic and you like i said i can't i need some more time to, to swirl that around so you know there might be a a prologue video to this season after i have had some time to kind of sit with it and maybe you know listen to have some more conversations but it was just beautifully done and fantastic and yes it definitely end it with a nice little bow which i did some googling and kind of poking around to see if um how what the plan for the series was and initially you know based the book began and end there's not a lovecraft country part two of the book so if they decide which i hope they do if they decide to have another season it will definitely be new stories that aren't currently in existence because the book is the book has ended the storyline that's that's you know in the book for the most part i think has been kind of played through of course as with books and with the television or movie adaptations there's always some, some other things that aren't necessarily you can't it's not a you know one-to-one -one. and i actually plan on reading the book to just kind of see how the story plays out in the book because i have when i was doing research just in general for the series there are some differences like d is a boy in the book um so there are some differences but I just fantastic just mwah. but one of the things so I always am making notes when I'm watching this to kind of see what um, what are some of the themes that I notice and one of the themes okay let's talk about Ruby I really really hoped that the connection that we were seeing with Ruby and Christina was going to end in a positive for Ruby. I really hoped. However, in hoping that, I also just had this fear that it wouldn't. And, you know, her, when Letty and Ruby were in the lighthouse and they were, you know, enacting their part of the plan, and when Ruby said what she said, and Letty, and I'm sure the rest of the audience realized that wait this is not this doesn't sound like Ruby this isn't how Ruby talks this sounds like Christina and the sinking feeling I didn't have a sinking feeling I had a feeling of right and what I wrote down after I had that feeling because terrible and I'm very sad that Ruby that we lost Ruby was in this moment what it made me think of um, and I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments was Ruby was an example of what happens when black women believe that white women ultimately have their back because Christina this entire series 
all of these shows, all the entire season, all the episodes, Christina showed herself to be a very self-serving individual who would do whatever it took in order to reach her ultimate goal. And, but she manipulated, she tried to use her, she tried to use kind of this girl power um, flag as the way that she would try to connect with the women who were also the black women who were a part of this story. She was constantly throwing up, you know, the patriarchy and, you know, male chauvinism and how it's unfair that men get to do this thing that women do not. But the entire time, it just felt for me like Christina was a symbol of white feminism, where as long as what, as long as, you know, if you're a black woman and I'm sure this could probably apply for other women of color, but I'm specifically talking about black women in this moment. If you are a black woman and you connect with the, the idea behind white feminism or feminism when there's a white woman kind of at the forefront. And of course, as women, we tend to be on the same page as women. However, when it, that's where intersectionality comes in because as black women, there we are at it we sit at an intersection of oppressions that white women don't experience but we are a force as ruby was a force letty was a force and so christina could see that they were a force and she would she continually use the let's fight the patriarchy against them because even with Chris, even with Ruby, when obviously her and Christina, their relationship and their feelings went beyond simply girl power, we're let's fight the patriarchy. Obviously their relationship, it crossed a line where they had romantic feelings for each other because Christina was William. And so in spite of that, Christina still would constantly bring up the whole the unfairness of being a woman and use that to get Ruby on her side and I really hoped that I could see though that Christina did care for Ruby I don't think that she didn't and that's the insidious dangerous nature of that I'm completely going off off um, on a tangent but that is the insidious na dangerous nature of when we see situations where a white woman is pushing forward her agenda and as you know and often it's feminism it's as you know equality equity as a woman and when black women get on board that train because we too seek equity as women but at certain points you hit a point where we're not on the same page and what happens and what we see happen in real life in real time is that those white women will turn on the black woman and so we saw that play out in in the in the show and to the very end where Christina you know in spite of her feelings for Ruby her her goal her ultimate goal to be immortal and to you know to go beyond the patriarchy and to supersede the sons of Adam and what they what they were doing and when they how they're keeping women out when Ruby showed herself to no longer be a valuable tool and to be and to have her own you know her own thing that she's trying to accomplish that in Christina's eyes went against that she had to go and that was just and it was so crazy because I wanted to I wasn't sad. Um, I know, no, I wasn't sad. I wasn't surprised. Um, I was definitely disheartened as hell. So disheartened and just wrong, wrong. like, damn it. Um, Ruby, I hope, I really hope that that wasn't the case, but I was not surprised that that was. And so it's just very interesting seeing that play out. Um, what I did love, 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 love was I've been seeing all of these conversations online with how Tick treated Gia versus how he treated Letty. And yes, this is something that we, we as I've seen a lot of black women talk about when we are talking about relationships with black women and black men and how we often get the worst of, you know, of black men. We get the, 
we get the unvarnished, unfiltered versions of them, which is not always best, depending on whatever trauma and what things that they're dealing with personally. But when it comes to other women, because those women don't share their experience and they ne can't necessarily, you know, maybe they can't relate. I don't know. I don't know the why. I can't, I'm not going to pretend to know the why. But for whatever reason, what we'll see in other instances with other women who are not black women, when they are involved with black men, they get they get this, you know, the sugar, they get the sweetness. And that's what we saw play out with Gia's story and Tick, where, you know, he courted her and he was so sweet and loving and he wanted to be with her and it was so romantic and it was so nice. And then, you know, him and Letty, it was like a battle the whole time. Now, there were still moments though, where it was never a doubt that he didn't love and care for Letty and want the best for her and, you know, but we didn't always see that sweetness and that softness until the very end. So we see that this last episode when they're getting um, baptized and he puts his hand on her stomach finally, because this was kind of the first moment where he physically acknowledged their child. Now, we it was kind of, an, uh, we all knew, they all knew that she was pregnant and we all knew, they all knew that they were moving towards a specific goal with that child in mind. So it was never a thought that, the, the kid was not a, a factor and being considered. But just that moment where he put his hand on her, um, you know, on her growing belly um, and it's like, I wish I had more time. And it was like, oh, we finally, finally get some sweetness and some softness from Tick for Letty. And, you know, and then they have that moment and I'm glad they had that moment. I hate that they didn't have more of those moments, but I'm glad that they finally did. Um, because, you know, we know where we're headed with that and we know how it ended with Tick not making it. And so, but what I also love was how he took the time to meet up with Gia and essentially apologize for being a dick because he was really, really mean and rude and nasty to her. And, you know, you, you get the why. He was surprised. He was afraid. He was taken off guard. He felt like she encroached um, on his on his separation of her because he thought he was just over it. But it still didn't warn him talking to her the way he did when she came to the house to help. Um, and so I'm glad that they had that come together. And I love that she played a part in making the spell happen. Because as we saw, you know, when Tick drank um, Christina's blood, it wasn't Christina's blood. It might have even been Ruby's blood. And so we, you know, we know that the spell needed to have the body of Christina, um, the body of Titus, and the body of uh, her father, whose name I just completely forgot. Not Titus, yeah, yeah, um, you know, it needed all three of them in order to bind her. And so we, I'm glad, it was so awesome seeing Gia figure out that she can use her kumiho, she as a kumiho, she can use that power for good. Um, and that I saw that in my research when I was looking up, learning more about a kumiho and what that was for that particular recap. That they're not always, they're not default bad. Like they can be good, and in some instances, they they do good things. And so I really liked how she kind of came together and supported the ultimate goal of what they were working towards and played a role. And it was just, I made another note. It was kind of what it looks like when non-black people of color, specifically women of color, come to the place and, you know, ultimately they were fighting um, the white supremacy of magic because white people had access to magic and black people did not. And so they were fighting, they were fighting to change that and make magic accessible to black people. Um, and Gia came in and supported that out, supported that with her actions as a non-black woman of color, which I was like, oh, that's really cool. Solidarity, allyship, dope, 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 dope. So I really liked how all of the pieces came together. One, another note, um, I, I made a note because I was thinking about the relationship with George Montrose and um, Tick's mom, who I just, I don't know why I want to forget her name. Um, I'm looking at my other notes and I, um, you know, were they in a poly, were they in a poly, um, a polyamorous relationship? Like, would have been what, polyandry? Um, 
because that's kind of how they describe it. It was like, we realized that we all loved each other and, and you know, it doesn't, and I say polyandry instead of poly polygamy because I think polygamy is man-centered while as well as po polyandry or polyandry. Po ah, my pronunciations are terrible right now. But polyandry is woman-centered. And so she and Montrose had a, they were married and they had a bond and a connection, but they weren't romantic. She and George had a romantic relationship and a romantic partnership. And so it sounds like for some time that three, uh, that the three of them kind of lived in a a relationship together where they agreed um, to be together and they were gonna, you know, whenever Montrose was born, not Montrose, I'm sorry, Tick, whenever Tick was born, they were gonna raise him because his uncle George was definitely a part of the village. And so was Hippolyta when he, and so when George met Hippolyta, it was like, okay, great, Hippolyta is also part of the village. And you know, the very first episode when Montrose comes back to the house, like D jumps on him with this level of excitement and love. Like it was very brother and sister, you know, like kind of if, if some people have like, they're like, that's my cousin brother or my cousin sister, where you are cousins by relation, but you were raised as siblings. That was a sibling type of relationship. It was not a um, kind of, you know, cousin where we see each other during family times. We might be cool and close as cousins. There was definitely a brother sister vibe. And so I think that I made a note and I'm curious, let me know your thoughts, but do you think if they were in a poly relationship, um, and even I love the way that this series kind of played around with relationships and not only just introduced us to the fluidity of relationships and connections. Because even with Ruby and Christina and William, it was a it was kind of a poly type of situation where, you know, once Ruby knew that William was Christina, she still was involved with William, which means she was involved with Christina. And so it, it was through magic and definitely is kind of, you know, but it was just interesting. I made a note, wanted to throw it out there and see what you thought. Um, but that's it, that's episode 10. I'm gonna have to sit on this cause I might want to come up back and make another video to talk more. But what did you think about this? Um, I really, 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 really hope that they decide to dig into some other stories that can possibly come up. I will, oh, the last part I wanted to mention about D. I'm so glad they were able to um, to bring her back. I would, I did notice though at the end that Dee was no longer that sweet little girl that we met in the beginning. And this definitely was indicative. I saw a lot of conversations happen, talking about how the fact that in the episode with Topsy and Bobsy, how none of the adults were really kind of paying attention to Dee and she was going through her own personal hell and how this is not uncommon with little black girls for sure. And as the result of that, the D that we see now is more mature and aged in a way that she's lost her innocence. And I hate that. Um, and I really would love to see the storyline go, you know, she had this, first of all, she had that dope ass arm and she took Christina out. I like that she's the one who did it. Um, I don't know why I liked it, I just did. I appreciated that versus the Shuggas. I, I, I appreciated that it was D that, that killed Christina versus the Shuggas. Now it could have been any of the other adults that would have been fine, but I, I think having the shadow to do it would have been a cop out. So I appreciated that D was the one that, that ended her life. Um, but I'm sad that D was the one because D changed. And that to me was sad. And I would love to see how her and Hippolyta, you know, address their new selves and how they grow into who they're going to be next. Um, but that's it. That's my recap for episode 10 of Lovecraft Country, the finale. What were your thoughts? What did you feel? I'm about to have a sip of this because I need a, a tip of wine, but I would love to hear from you. Let's talk about it in the comments. This is the last one. No more cinnamon. We're not going to hear it anymore unless we rewatch it, which it's very likely that I might. So let me know your thoughts. I would love to hear from them. This was fun. I'm so excited for this. Um, I'll be back with more content. So if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. I would love to invite you to join me on the rest of this journey and other videos that I share here. So with that, subscribe and I look forward to the next time we can talk again. Bye.